Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, today's talk is about, you know, the big question that we're all studying, the linguists and philosophers of language and some, but not all logicians, uh, which is how do we communicate? I have a belief in my head and then I grunt and then you have a belief in your head and that's magical. And how does it happen? And, you know, it, it is standardly decomposed into two different questions, which is convention and psychology. And so, you know, there's the, the word dog refers to dogs and it's not because they bark and it's because of convention. We've decided for that sound to refer to dogs. And, you know, that's just something that speakers have to learn. Uh, and uh, it's just a matter of, of convention of us agreeing on a certain practice. But then there are parts of communication that are not conventional are in, and are instead a part of rational psychology. And Kyle is going to go through many examples of this, among which include when I tell you Anne ate some of the cake, Anne ate some of the cake, uh, you, uh, from convention, you know, there's something you learn, but you also learn something else, which is she didn't eat all of the cake. And that's not part of the conventional meaning. It's instead something that you do some inference, some mind reading about my beliefs. And that's what this talk is about, is the semantic pragmatics distinction, you know, where the former is about convention and what speakers have to just learn. And then uh, pragmatics is about psychology and it's what they can infer on the basis. And the question is, how do we tell the difference? And we think that most philosophers are confused about how to tell the difference. Um, and there basically has been recent work in the last 15 years of linguistics that is very important uh, that you know, draw some light on this. And the main way that philosophers are confused is that many philosophers think that the mark of pragmatic phenomenon is cancelability, which means an inference is pragmatic if you can, you know, if you can take it back. So you say something and if some information you can say, oh, but not that, uh, oh, I didn't mean that, then that means it's pragmatic. And we think that's wrong. Uh, that's not the mark of uh, pragmatics versus semantics. The mark of semantics is instead embeddability, which means if you have some kind of inference that in a certain way that Kyle will explicate in painful detail, when you have some kind of inference that happens under the scope of uh, higher operators like quantifiers, that's when something's semantic. And the reason for that is that the key slogan we want is that cancellation is disambiguation. Uh, which is a slogan I learned in the first place from my old, old advisor, uh, Ernie Lepore, who has a book, uh, I, which I don't remember the title of. It wasn't a good title, something like Imagination and Convention or something, you know, one of those terrible two word titles uh, that are, you know, born to be forgotten. But anyways, the point is, when you have cancellation, what's actually going on is there's two different logical forms, and then you're deciding between which of them, and you're coordinating on which of them. And it's not that, you know, it's not that the information was just pragmatic, it's that no, there is a logical form that literally entails the information, but you had to figure out which logical form was intended by the speaker. And that's what this talk is about. Uh, and basically what we're going to do is first, we are going to tell you about existing work that's been pursuing this uh, in the domain of scalar implicature, which is when you say something and you could have said something stronger, but didn't. And we're gonna tell you what's already been done there. And then we're gonna show you our value add, which is generalizing that kind of dialectic to a different domain, which is a different kind of pragmatic norm, something involving manner, uh, something involving a rule that when you say something, it should be uh, new information uh, in the, in the uh, context when you say it. But all these details, Kyle's going to, orient you now for like 25 minutes and then I will return. Uh, so thank you. Um, thanks, Simon. Uh, yeah, so just before I start, I just want to say thanks a lot for having us give a talk today. I'm um, really looking forward to this and, and thanks everyone for attending. Um, yes, yeah, so as Simon said, uh, what we're going to do, uh, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to just give you kind of uh, what, how semantics have been thinking about scale and pictures over the last decade or so. Um, because It'll really be a helpful way to frame uh, what our, our, as Simon said, our value add and our account. Because a lot of the moves that are made in the scaling and picture literature, a lot of the moves that the semanticists are making, uh, they, they're kind of moves that we are very sympathetic to, and, and they're moves that we, we're also going to make uh, when it comes to, to our child behavior. So I'm just going to run over uh, just, just how semanticists are thinking about scaling and pictures. So, what are scaling and pictures? Um, well, I think most of the data here should be familiar to most of you. Uh, uh, it goes back to Grice and it, it involves uh, things like 1A. So if I say Anne ate some of the cake, uh, you, you tend to infer or conclude that Anne didn't eat all of the cake. And uh, that's kind of surprising. If you just take the kind of um, very uh, 
uh, a simple standard meaning of some, which is not nothing. You know, not nothing is compatible with all, but then somehow when you say one A, it kind of gets strengthened. The sum gets strengthened into some, but not all. And that's, that's a scalar. And this arises with a number of expressions. So sometimes these are called implicature triggers. Uh, so for instance, in two, we have numerals like four, uh, generally, numerals are given a kind of weak semantics where they mean at least four, but then when you say there will be four of us at dinner tonight, somehow we conclude from that there won't be five of us at dinner tonight. So again, there's kind of like the strengthening that's happening, is this, and that's, that's the implicature. Just a final example, uh, so these are uh, possibility modals like may, and those are generally given quite a weak semantics where it just says that there's some situation that's good that's compatible with p, that's what may p means. But somehow when I say you may have an apple, you also tend to conclude that um, you don't have to have an apple. So again, it's like the meaning of may is strengthened here into like may, but you don't have to. Okay, so those are, that's the kind of the basic data. And semanticists have, have drawn attention to two important features of scale implicatures. And, and, and these features are important because they, um, they kind of shape the space of theories you can give of, of scale implicatures. They constrain the kind of theories that you can give. And, the first feature is uh, locality. I think what Simon uh, referred to as embeddability. And the idea here is that scalar implicatures can, um, they can appear in embedded environments. They, can, they, they, in, they, they exhibit interesting scopal interactions with other operators. And in particular, the, the one I'll uh, illustrate is in four uh, with quantifiers. So scalar implicatures can take scope beneath quantifiers. So 4A is every professor who fails, some of the students will be put on probation but every professor who fails, all of the students will be fired, okay? And 4A is perfectly coherent, but the only way that it could be coherent is if um, some in the first, uh, first conjunct meant some but not all. So we understand this as every professor who fails, some but not all of the students will be put on probation. And, and, and some has to, has to uh, mean some but not all here because otherwise the sentence would be incoherent. And that's because it's known that uh, the restrictors of universal quantifiers are downward monotonic environments. So if you have uh, a sentence like every PQ, so if it's a form of every PQ and R entails P, then you're also gonna have every RQ. Um, so if some just meant it's kind of a very weak, not nothing uh, meaning, then you'd have every professor who fails, not none of the students will be put on probation. That's gonna entail every professor who fails, all of the students will be put on probation. But that directly contradicts the second sentence. Okay, the second sentence says, every professor who fails, all of the students will be fired. And obviously being fired and being put on probation are not compatible. So you have the, the scalar implicature triggered by some, you have it taking the local scope, it, it scopes beneath the quantifier and it's just kind of uh, restricted to, to the restrictor of the quantifier. And, a similar thing happens in five there where the uh, scalar implicature is just uh, kind of scoping within the antecedent of a conditional. I'm not gonna step through it, but I, I think you'll, you'll get the general idea. Okay, so that's locality. So the idea is that scalar implicatures, they enter into interesting uh, scope relations with, with other operators. Uh, the, the second important feature is uh, also something that, that Simon mentioned. Um, he, called he called it cancelability. That kind of goes back to Grice. The way semanticists talk these days is they say optionality. So the idea is that uh, scalar implicatures are optional. They're, they're just some environments where these things just go away. Okay? They're, just, they're just not present. Um, and one environment is under negation. So if I say Anne didn't eat some of the cake, okay, that's not equivalent to uh, 6B. Anne ate all of the cake or none of it. Uh, you know, and didn't eat some of the cake. Well, yeah, that just, you know, that's not compatible with and eating all of the cake. But if the implicature was present and it's scoped below negation there, then 6a would be equivalent to 6b, okay, because 6a would mean not, and then and didn't eat some, but not all of the cake, which if you work it out, that's just the same as 6b, but that's not what it means. So what's happening is that the implicature is just kind of going away. It's being, it's being cancelled. So why are these two features? Uh, locality and optionality, why are they, they important? Well, locality has, has kind of convinced semanticists that uh, scalar implicatures are not a pragmatic phenomenon, okay? They, 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 they aren't best modeled or best explained by appealing to pragmatic principles, like the kind of thing that, that Grice was interested in. Why is that? Well, uh, pragmatic principles just have a really hard time um, explaining how uh, implicatures could appear at embedded levels. Okay? But generally, pragmatic principles are things that happen at the discourse level. They happen with whole sentences. 
they, they can't be used to explain how things happen at the substantial level. So semantics are thinking, okay, locality is telling us that, uh, so that implicatures are a semantic phenomenon. Uh, but then what's interesting is that optionality is then constraining the kind of semantic mechanism that can be behind scalar implicative. Because if you just look at locality and you look at the data in one, two, one through three, you might think, oh, well, it turns out that, uh, you know, implicatures are just part of the standing meaning of, of the relevant trigger. So you might just think, oh, well, some doesn't mean not nothing. Some just means some, but not all. Um, but optionality shows us that that's not, that's not right. Okay? That's not the true account because uh, if, uh, some just means some, but not all, then, uh, you know, the implicature should also be appearing under negation. It should, it should never be cancelled, but we can see that it's cancelled. So, um, how have, so how have semanticists tried to kind of reconcile these two things, the locality and optionality? Well, the way they go is they say, uh, the, the mechanism that generates implicatures is semantic, okay, um, in that it's, it arises from an operator that appears in logical form, but this operator is optional, and that's, and that's going to explain the optionality. So uh, this operator can enter into interesting scope relations with, with other um, expressions, which explains the locality, but doesn't always have to be there. Like, for instance, it's going to go away under negation, which explains why uh, in 6a, for instance, we don't have a scalar implicative. Now, I'll just step through this just quickly what this operator looks like. Um, so semanticists call it uh, the exhaustification operator. Uh, I'm representing it here with EXH. And the idea is that you exhaustify a content P. Uh, it, if you exhaustify a content P, then you assert P. So P has to be true. And you say that all relevant alternatives to P are false. Okay, that's what the all Q element of, of alt P. Alt P are the relevant alternatives. And there are lots of choice points in how you develop this exhaustification operator. They all really involve what relevant alternatives mean. We don't have to get, through, get into any of that. I'll just give you a very rough sense. The idea is that you'd give something like 1a and ate some of the cake, you'd give that the logical form in 7b, where you have exh and then an ate some of the cake. And let's just suppose that the only relevant alternative to an ate some of the cake is an ate all of the cake. Well, then you're going to end up to what's 7b is only going to be true when uh, an ate some of the cake, and it's not the case that she ate all of the cake, which is exactly the kind of strengthened meaning that we, that we were picking up when we first considered 1a. And just to repeat, because uh, the exhaustification operator is like, you know, a tangible bit of logical form, it's the kind of thing that can, uh, you know, appear in embedded environments. So we're going to, uh, in order to handle the um, locality of scalar implicatives, uh, you're going to basically have exhaust the exhaustification operator appearing uh, under the scope of certain operators. So for instance, we'll give the first sentence in 4a, every professor who fails some of the students will be put on probation. We give that the uh, logical form in 7D. So you have every, that's the quantifier, and then the exhaustification operator is taking, taking scope below it. And that's, that's going to give us uh, the reading that we want, where um, every professor who fails some, but not all of the students uh, will be put on probation. Okay, so just to summarize the kind of the, the, what's happening with scalar implicatures in the semantics literature, initially people thought that implicatures were just clearly a pragmatic phenomenon. Then semanticists uh, kind of drew attention to this locality data where these implicatures were, were really taking scope uh, under, under other operators um, and, and it occurred in embedded positions. And that was pushing them to think that uh, actually it's a semantic mechanism that's responsible for implicatures, but that mechanism can't be something simple, like just part of the standing meaning of uh, the relevant expression uh, because of the optionality data. Instead, it has to be something like, um, or be, that they've thought that it's instead uh, due to a optional operator that appears in logical form. Okay, and uh, keep in mind all those moves because these are moves that Simon and I are going to make in response to the data that we're going to consider now. So uh, what are we interested in in this talk? Well, uh, we're interested in, in, in what we'll call uh, ignorance effects. And, and broadly, ignorance effects uh, occur when uh, you have attitude verbs and, and modal operators implying that uh, various bodies of information are undecided about uh, various claims. And what, what do I mean by undecided? Uh, well, basically it means that the bodies of information don't entail those claims and they don't contradict them. Okay? They kind of leave those claims unsettled. Uh, and there are three kind of subtypes of ignorance effects that we're interested in here. So there's three kind of subcategories. Just run through them. The first is uh, what people call diversity effects. It has been discussed by a lot of people just to illustrate with attitudes. Consider 8a. 
the detective thinks that Anne didn't commit the crime and he hopes that she did. Okay, that's like a very weird speech. Similarly, if you, you say he fears that she did, it's really strange. Uh, more generally, it's just really odd uh, for a subject to be certain that not P and then to go on to say that they hope P or they fear P or they wonder P or they want P. That's very strange. Uh, you know, a uh, subject can't kind of be, can't foreclose on the possibility of P if, they, if they're going to hope for P. Um, similarly, uh, uh, consider 8B, the detective thinks that Anne committed the crime and he hopes, fears that she did. That's also very strange. So again, a subject can't be certain of P and then go on to hope P or fear P. That's, that, that's kind of strange. Uh, in other words, people have said that the subject's beliefs need to be diverse with respect to P in order for them to have these attitudes. Uh, or uh, in, in, our, in our lingo, they need to be ignorant. So that's diversity. Uh, when it comes to attitudes, we want to explain what's going on there. Uh, diversity with respect to modals, uh, just to illustrate what we mean by that, consider nine, Mary must read Ulysses. Uh, well, what diversity says is that the background kind of uh, set of possibilities that are used to evaluate nine, what, what are sometimes called the modal base, that modal base can't um, entail that Mary reads Ulysses and also can't foreclose on the possibility that she reads Ulysses. Again, the modal base needs to be kind of ignorant of, of whether Mary uh, uh, reads Ulysses. And, it's not like you get really strong kind of linguistic judgments that are supposed to motivate diversity for modals here. It's more theoretical. People have used diversity uh, for modals to explain a number of other phenomena in, in, in linguistics. Okay, that's the first kind of effect we're interested in, diversity. Uh, second effect has been discussed a little less, but uh, maybe more and more over the last uh, couple, sort of five years or so. And this is the ignorance effects um, that logically complex sentences give rise to when there is in the scope of attitudes. So here we're thinking about disjunctions and uh, conjunctions. So just to illustrate, suppose the detective has ruled out that Anne committed the crime. Okay, he's certain that she's innocent. Then in that context, it's, it's kind of strange to say something like the detective believes that Anne or Bill committed the crime. Okay, the subject has already ruled out one of the disjuncts. It's bad to say, well, they believe, disjunct A, it's bad to say they believe A or B. Uh, and just more generally, it's not just, just doesn't just happen with belief, it happens with hope, fear, wonder, want, etc. Uh, if S V's, where V is an attitude verb, A or B, then uh, S can't already uh, believe not A. Okay? They, need to, they need to be ignorant about each of the disjuncts uh, that's, that's in the scope of the report. Uh, a similar thing happens with conjunction. So I uh, suppose that Mary saw that Anne brought apple pie. Uh, there, it's a bit strange to follow that up by saying Mary hopes that Anne brought apple pie and Bill brought blueberry pie. That's a bit weird. Um, so again, it looks like the subject needs to be ignorant of uh, each of the conjuncts. Uh, they, they, can't, they can't already know that the conjuncts hold. So if S, V is A and B, then S can't already believe A. And sometimes the ignorance effect with conjunction and uh, under attitude verbs is, is a little bit delicate. So I'm just going to give you another example, which at least to my ear brings it out a bit more, more clearly. So suppose Mary knows that Anne is pregnant. It's a bit strange in that context to say Mary hopes that Anne is pregnant and expecting a daughter. That's kind of redundant. Uh, so that's the second effect that we're interested in. Uh, the third and final effect is the um, ignorance effects that are, are, are generated by logically complex sentences in the scope of modals. And here there's been lots of literature on this. Um, so the first kind of effect here is uh, three choice effects. So uh, this is when you have disjunctions in the scope of possibility modals. So uh, 13a, Mary may read Ulysses or Madame Bovary. What's interesting is that we tend to uh, conclude from that that Mary may read Ulysses and she may read Madame Bovary. Okay, this, it's like disjunctions distribute when they're in the scope of possibility modals. And this does not follow uh, from the standard semantics of possibility modals at all. Uh, and another effect here is uh, Ross's inference, we'll, that we'll call it Ross's inference. Again, it's been discussed by many people. So this is when you have disjunctions in the scope of necessity modals. So Mary is requi required to read Ulysses and Madame Bovary. Uh, again, there we tend to conclude that Mary may read Ulysses and she may read Madame Bovary, and that doesn't follow from the standard semantics for necessity modals. Uh, okay, so those are, those are the kind of basic ignorance effects that, that, we, that we try to capture. Uh, and then just as semanticist noted uh, that scalar implicatures uh, have these important features of locality and optionality, we're, we're now going to observe that um, ignorance effects also uh, are local and optional. And so for locality, so now I'm looking at 15, uh, suppose that there are uh, three detectives and two suspects, Anne and Bill, and suppose that one detective has already ruled out Anne, okay, he's certain that she's innocent, 
but the other two detectives don't know anything yet, right? That's, that's the context. Um, then it's fine to say exactly two detectives believe that Anne or Will committed the crime. Okay? And, uh, or at least there's a very salient kind of good reading of that sentence. Maybe there's a, also a bad reading, but you can certainly hear that as good. That's what's important for us. And on that reading, uh, what, what 15 seems to be saying is, at least the belief variant is, exactly two detectives believe that Anne or Will committed the crime. And they're ignorant as to whether Anne committed the crime, and they're ignorant as to whether Bill committed the crime. So the ignorance effect is taking scope underneath the uh, numerical quantifier exactly two, okay? just as we saw scalar amplitudes did. And same thing happens with other attitudes, hoping, fearing, wondering. And I should say, uh, this judgment that um, 15 is good in, in, in this context, this, is, this doesn't just come from um, um, Simon and, and me. This is a thing that's actually been uh, empirically investigated and it's very robust. So uh, Cremers et al. have got a recent paper where they run a bunch of experiments and people, subjects really like uh, these sentences so they, they think they're true in context. Um, and uh, we also think that uh, the kind of ignorance effects that are generated by conjunctions, they can also uh, take local scope. So uh, suppose, this is in 16, suppose that Mary has three friends. One already knows that Anne is pregnant, but the others don't know anything yet. Uh, but suppose that they'd all be overjoyed if they found out that um, uh, Anne is expecting a daughter. Then in that context, we think it's just true to say exactly two of Mary's friends hope that Anne is pregnant and expecting a daughter. Yeah, but again, the only way you could explain that is if the ignorance effect was taking a scope underneath the quantifier. So uh, that 16 means something like at least on his belief, uh, on his hope variant, uh, exactly two of Mary's friends hope that Anne is pregnant and expecting a daughter, and they're ignorant as to whether um, Anne is pregnant. Uh, so that's locality for, for attitudes. Uh, what about modals? Uh, well, actually, it's fairly well known that um, the kind of effect, ignorance effects with modals that we're interested in are scope under quantifiers. So um, he has uh, an instance with free choice. So suppose that some students are permitted to read both Ulysses and Madame Bovary, while others are only uh, allowed to read Ulysses. So that is, uh, certain students can, can only read Ulysses, they, they're not permitted to read Madame Bovary. Then people tend to judge uh, 17, 17 as having a very salient false reading. Okay? People tend to judge it as bad. Uh, every student may read Ulysses or Madame Bovary. And we can explain why they judge it, judge it as bad. Um, if the uh, ignorance effect was taking scope under the quantifier, so that 17 means something like every student X is such that X may read Ulysses and X may read Madame Bovary, which directly contradicts uh, the context. Okay, so it's looking like these ignorance effects are, can, can, inter, can enter into interesting um, um, scopal relations with, with other expressions. What about optionality? Uh, well, here, just as we noted for scalar implicatures, or just as Samantis noted for scalar implicatures, these ignorance effects also tend to disappear uh, systematically in certain environments particular under negation. So consider 18a, the detective doesn't believe that Anne or Bill did it. Well, the point is that 18a is just equivalent to 18b. The detective doesn't believe that Anne did it, and the detective doesn't believe that uh, Bill did it. It's not equivalent to 18c, the detective doesn't believe that Anne did it, or the detective doesn't believe that Bill did it. 18a uh, just isn't compatible with the detective being certain that Anne did it. It's just it's not, a, a, it's not an available reading. Um, but 18a would, would be equivalent to 18c if the ignorance effect was taking scope uh, un underneath the leaf there. So uh, just as with scalar implicatures, you have this ignorance effect um, going away when uh, under, under negation. Uh, similar thing happens with modals. So it's fairly well known that the free choice inference in particular, that goes away under, under negation. So 19a, Mary may not read Ulysses and Madame Bovary. Uh, that's just equivalent to Mary may not read Ulysses and Mary may not read Madame Bovary. It's not equivalent to the weaker 19C. Mary may not read Ulysses or Mary may not read Madame Bovary. But again, if you had the free choice effect taking scope under negation in 19A, it would be equivalent to the weaker thing. So we know that, the, that these ignorance effects just tend to go away. And so uh, I hope that the parallels with the scalar and picture literature should, should, should be pretty clear um, by now. Um, and we want to essentially make a similar move as, as people have made in the scalar and picture literature where, they, where we want to say that, well, look, the uh, locality of these ignorance effects pushes us towards a semantic account of, of ignorance, um, but the optionality constrains that semantic account. So we can't, we think that uh, uh, whatever is explaining uh, these ignorance effects can't be due to the standing meaning of uh, modals and attitude verbs. Instead, it has to be something that's kind of optional 
And uh, just as uh, the exhaustifiers try to explain uh, scalar amplitudes by appealing to an exhaustification operator, what we're going to suggest is that ignorance effects are best explained by an optional operator that appears at logical form. And I'm going to hand you over to Simon because he's going to step through how that works. Our rule is don't be redundant. That's our big concept. Don't be redundant. That's what Stallnacker first said. Uh, and the idea is when you're having a conversation, there's a body of information from the conversation, which is like what's commonly believed. And the rule don't be redundant says if you're gonna to contribute to the conversation, like you're gonna say it's raining, uh, it shouldn't be redundant relative to that body of information, which means it shouldn't be entailed by the body of information and it shouldn't be inconsistent with it. The goal is to narrow down the context set without destroying it. So you want to say something that's true at some but not all possible worlds compatible with the information. That's don't be redundant. Now, Stallnacker thought that was a pragmatic rule, but we are going to somaticize and dramaticalize it. So we're going to say there is a non-redundancy operator, R, for non-redundancy. And what RP says, is it says P is true, but also P is not redundant in the relevant body of information. So it's neither entailed by nor inconsistent with the relevant body of information. So P is true at some worlds in the body of information and it's false at other worlds. So a body of information is a set of worlds. We're letting S be the variable for a body of information. Sometimes linguists call this body of information a local context. But here's the key though, that's a little complicated for implementation is that for us, the body of information that's relevant to a sentence, to, to, to RP, to redundancy, is not always the overall uh, context. It's not always our common beliefs. It also, it's incremental. So basically, like, when you have a conjunction, you know, and you want to talk about the second conjunct, you also add the first conjunct to it. So the idea is that as we have a communicate with a discourse, uh, as we go, you know, th th there's kind of this accumulating body of information that's not always just everything we are keep agreeing to. Sometimes it can be a hypothetical body of information. And we're thinking about these hypothetical bodies of information whenever we're looking at a part of a sentence. Each part of a sentence gets assessed at that hypothetical body of information. And then when you have the R operator, wherever it's embedded, it looks at the relevant body of information that's been accumulated and says, okay, RP, what I say is P is true, and P is neither, you know, is not redundant in the local body of information that's been accumulated. Unfortunately, the implementation of this idea for us is slightly messy. But, but before I get to that, I just want to say big picture then, what's happening with the data is that we're going to be inserting this R operator within logical forms underneath quantifiers and stuff. And so because it's underneath quantifiers, it's going to get you that, uh, what's the lingo, the local, it's going to get the locality of the phenomenon that Kyle was talking about. Uh, and, you know, basically throughout the talk, I'm going to be listing, like, I'm going to give you the logical forms that's kind of, you know, you, that's one level of understanding of what we're doing, but then also we're, we'll walk through some derivations of actually how the operator works, but there the implementation is a little messy, but basically here's the implementation is we're going to be using a trivalent system. So we have three truth values, one, zero, and hash. And the idea is when you fail the redundancy requirement, you're undefined rather than false. And that's really for technical reasons, um, which is it just kind of allows us to accumulate the you know errors it allows us to accumulate errors in a way that predicts the data but the key is the kind of error accumulation we're going to be doing with our undefinedness is going to be different than like presupposition projection and stuff in principle it could be different it's kind of home brewed for this application and i'll kind of show you how that goes so clause 20 is our is where we begin and the key is we're evaluating the truth of any sentence relative to a pair of s which is a body of information and then a possible world and the idea is okay you know, when you have the RP, it's not just true or false in a world, it's also relative to a body of information that at least for, you know, in the, in the first instance is just the overall conversation. So the idea being, if you say RP, if I say R, it's raining, that's pronounced in English, it's raining, but there might be an R hidden in logical form. If I say R, it's raining, okay, well, that'll be undefined if the current conversation, uh, if, if that would be redundant to say in the conversation. So that's why we have this uh, S operator, uh, this S uh, parameter here. Uh, and then it can either be true, false, or undefined. Let's start with the undefined condition. Undefined condition says, well, it's undefined RP when it would be redundant. Um, and it's redundant when it has the same, when it's either true everywhere in the, in the body of information or false everywhere. And that's equivalent to this condition here, which says there aren't two different worlds in the body of information that disagree about P. 
They either all say P is true or they all say P is false. So that would be the undefined case. That's when you can't say RP because it would be redundant. And then, then, and then the other cases, one and zero, are when no, it, it's not redundant. So you know, it's it's pregnant. You know, it satisfies that that rule to say. Um, but then whether it's true or false just depends on P. And that just shows you how P has RP has two parts. It's the conjunction of P with a definedness requirement that uh, that P is uh, you know interesting in the body of information. So it's you know true at some worlds, false at others. Okay. And then the key though um, is that then we have this undefinedness, and then technically the way we implement that is it percolates up using uh, weak cleany. Um, and I think uh, if I remember, that means that any undefinedness anywhere uh, gets you, uh, yeah, it, 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 if any part is undefined, the whole thing's undefined. So the idea is if you say a complex sentence that has an R anywhere in it, if, if anywhere in it uh, the R test is failed, then the whole thing is bad. The whole thing's undefined. And that's going to help a lot um, as we go on. And then the next thing we need, though, which is probably a bit unfamiliar, is that, so we have this local body of information relative to which uh, we're testing for redundancy, but the key is it is accumulative and it accumulates information on the way with a particular, you know, with, with an algorithm that can be varied based on, you know, the exact data that, you know, th there's some disagreements about very specific details of the data and you can kind of tweak this algorithm, but it, it's, it's in a slightly unfamiliar way. So like, um, okay, the parts that make sense is, okay, like, uh, uh, conjunctions like when you get to, when you say it's raining and it's Monday by the time you get to it's Monday you you, you want to narrow down to the to the raining world um, uh, in the context set but then the key is for disjunction uh, and this is kind of the hypothetical part um, it's like it's not always information that you've accepted it's just the hypothetical information relevant to where you are in the discourse and when you say P or Q the information relevant for Q is going to update on not P and so it's kind of like you say P or if not P, then Q. It's kind of like that. Um, and that's just how the, that doesn't matter that much though for what we're doing. So you know, we don't want to get too distracted there. Um, but then uh, the next key component is we are putting this redundancy operator underneath attitude verbs and modal. So the characteristic logical form is going to be like John believes, uh, or you know, it'll be like John hopes are it's raining. You know, John hopes that non-redundantly it's raining. And so then we're going to let these attitude verbs kind of capture the redundancy requirement by saying whenever basically they map undefinedness to falsity. And so if you say John hopes R it's raining and the R part is undefined, then the hope sentence will be false. And that's basically how we're capturing the, the ignorance effects that we're interested in is we're saying these attitudes and, and modal operators that seem to require non-redundancy of their input. What's really happening is there's a non-redundancy operator that's making things undefined, and then the attitude verb has a meltdown. If it, if it gets something undefined, it says, no, you're false. Um, and that's kind of how this is working. Um, okay, I think the best way to illustrate this though is just with lots of applications. And, uh, and so let me just kind of walk you through how this works. And I also think this is a good time in the talk to do clarificatory questions as we go through some of these derivations, um, if you have questions about how it's going and stuff, but you know, we'll see. Um, but so feel free, always, yeah, feel free to stop the bus. Okay, so the first application Kyle had was the detective hopes that Anne committed the crime, you know, um, was the first example. And the logical form that we, and the idea was this has a requirement that, 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 uh, that the detective's belief state is, uh, is diverse. And I'm sorry, I did forget one thing, Kyle, didn't I? Um, which is also, we need to tell you how the local context works for attitude verbs. Um, and so what you need to know is, okay, when you have, well, let's just look at the sense, when you have the detective hopes that Anne committed the crime, the logical form we're gonna have is, is X, that's the detective hopes, R, A. So they hope that non-redundantly Anne committed the crime. And what that requires is that in the local context, in the relevant body of information for the complement of hoping, uh, it's neither entailed by nor uh, you know, rules out that and committed the crime. But then I need to tell you how hopes uh, works in order to look at that. And so the key is, so sorry, I skipped over that. So the key is that the local context or the relevant body of information for hopes is the agent's belief worlds. That's the key. So when I say uh, the detective hopes something, well, the redundancy operator is going to be doing a test on the agent's belief worlds. Now, what does hope do overall? Hope requires that all of the agent's best belief worlds you know, make the thing true. So when you hope it's raining, it has to be that all of the best belief worlds 
make it the discriminating. So that we have a distinction formally between the belief worlds, which is BXW, and then the subset of them that's best, which is best BXW. Hope is about, the, the main claim it's making is about the best worlds, but the key is that the relevant body of information that redundancy looks at is gonna be the overall belief worlds. And the way that's encoded in 23B for aficionados is that, uh, well, you can see it says, okay, in order for hopes P to be true at SW, first of all, every world of the best belief worlds, that's 23B right-hand side, every world of the best belief worlds has to make P true. But then the key is that the, the information for P gets shifted to BXW. So if P is of the form RA, well, it's the belief worlds that uh, do the redundancy test. And so, and I'm gonna show you how that works with the derivation now. So the key is we've got X hopes that none redundantly and committed the crime. X hopes RA. And that's, okay, so what does that take? We're doing the derivation in 26. So 26A, X hopes that and none redundantly committed the crime. That's gonna be true just in case. Well, first, okay, it's gotta be, Every of the best, all of Anne's best belief worlds have to be such that our, or, or of the detective, sorry, all of the detective's best belief worlds have to be such that, uh, that RA, so Anne non-redundantly committed the crime, has to be true at the pair of that belief world, uh, which is one of the best, and the overall set of the detective's uh, belief worlds, okay? And the key is, that because it's the overall belief worlds that are, that are in there in that superscript BXW, the requirement that R has you know, for definedness is that there's, a, there's one belief world where Anne did commit the crime and one belief world where Anne did not commit the crime. So basically what happens is every attitude verb and modal encodes which body of information it's going to impose redundancy checks on by way of shifting this body of information. And then the redundancy operator is going to say, okay, you gave me this body of information. I'm telling you, you know, that my complement, so and committed to the crime, has to be true of one of the worlds and false of one of the worlds. But then RA also requires that A is true. And so the upshot um, is going to be in 26C, basically what hoping uh, RA requires is that A is true at every best belief world and that the overall set of belief worlds is diverse with respect to A. So it contains a world where Anne committed the crime and a world where they didn't. And then if you look at 26D, what that all ends up amounting to logically is it means, okay, basically the detective hopes that Anne committed the crime and her beliefs are diverse with respect to whether the crime was committed. Okay, um, so if there aren't questions yet about that derivation, I'm gonna go on to the, the next example, uh, which is how we do ignorance. Uh, uh, and that was the example that Kyle had when you say the detective hopes that Anne or Bill committed the crime. There's a, you know, what people thought was an implicature. There's an effect of some kind that uh, it's consistent with the detective's belief that Anne committed the crime and consistent to build it. So you can't say that. It would be really weird to say that if the detective has totally ruled out Bill and is just zoomed in on Anne. You say the detective hopes that Anne or Bill committed the crime. No, it's got to be that the detective considers, uh, you know, each of them possible. And the logical form we're using for that is X hopes RA or RB. And that's, I think, a pretty interesting logical form if you look at it because, you know, it, it's pretty embedded in there. So you've got the complement of hopes is a disjunction and each disjunct has the R operator, you know. And, uh, uh, okay, and then when we go through these derivations, what happens is, well, again, it starts off the same to hope RA or RB. What you got to have is that the, all of the best belief worlds make RA or RB true but relative to the overall belief worlds. And then that's where our weak cleaning algorithm comes in because you've got, okay, so, so basically, you know, the hopes is requiring definedness of the whole disjunction. But in order for the disjunction to be defined, each disjunct has to be defined. And that means even when you put the R operators all the way down um, at, the, at each individual disjunct, their redundancy requirements will percolate up to require, you know, each one has to be defined. So if that makes sense. So that's why we were using a weak cleaning projection for undefinedness. And then, you know, we can make a look here. So 28C, so what does this require for RA or RB to be uh, true at a pair of an information, body of information, information state and a world? Uh, well, first of all, A or B is going to have to be true there. And so we're going to get the requirement that, that you know, the, the detective will have to hope that the disjunction is true. So each best world of their belief worlds will have to make the disjunction true. But then we also get all of these requirements. I don't want to get too bogged down in the details of these uh, exact requirements, um, but 
uh, uh, so I don't want to get too bogged down in the details of these exact requirements, but the key is you've got one requirement for A and one requirement for B. And each one is more or less saying that, okay, the belief worlds have to be consistent with A and they have to be consistent with B. Uh, and then 28D, the overall upshot of this sentence is, okay, you got to hope that Anne or Bill committed the crime, but also you can't have a belief about whether Anne committed the crime and you can't have a belief basically about whether Bill committed the crime. So some details there. And, uh, and uh, good, okay. So I also, I don't, I'm not gonna go through derivations, but I wanna give you LFs for a few other examples involving ignorance um, in 29 and so on. So, you know, we, Kyle talked about these quantified examples. When you say exactly two detectives hope that Anne or Bill committed the crime, the idea is, look, even if there's a third detective who has ruled out Bill, uh, so he, they're not ignorant about Bill and they, they, they do hope that Anne committed the crime, then the sentence, uh, uh, can still be uh, true because the exactly two, what it says is there's exactly two people who satisfy this full rich meaning. There's exactly two people, no more, no less, who satisfy the full rich meaning of, okay, their best worlds make the disjunction true, but also they consider each disjunct possible. And so that's the key is the strengthened meaning. And that's why it's not just pragmatic. And to get that strengthened meaning in 29b, what we're doing is under the scope of the quantifier exactly two, we've got that, and under the scope of hopes, we've got that R operator there, and that's how you're, we're getting the effect. And, uh, you know, similarly for the detective believes Anna Bill committed the crime, we're using a form like 30B. Uh, I don't want to get into too much details here, but it's kind of interesting. If we use the full form 30C, uh, actually it would be, uh, that would be, that, that would be an incoherent sentence because it would be too, it would actually produce the meaning that uh, the agent, uh, it, it's a contradictory meaning because it entails that actually the agent's belief worlds are undecided about the disjunction A or B. And so you get the contradiction that all of their belief worlds are A or B worlds, but also some of them aren't A or B worlds. And I just wanna give you, it doesn't really matter too much the details why, but I wanna give you the dialectic here. The dialectic is, okay, so 30C, if we put two redundancy operators in that sentence with belief rather than hope, you would get a contradiction. But the key is the way the game is played, for us that makes us win is uh that uh okay then just don't put the operator there like because this the, the idea is in communication we're constantly deciding how many operators to put in places and we don't put extra operators if it actually creates a contradiction so that's fine and we just use 30b and that gets the right data um so just to give you a feeling so basically when you have this these optional operators sometimes they might produce some inconsistent meanings but that's okay those get filtered out by the process of deciding what logical forms to use um, and then just, you know, definitely for conjunctions also that have ignorance effects, Kyle talked about, we're just going to be putting the redundancy operator in each contract. And then the last data point that I want to go over before I hand it back to Kyle, and he kind of waxes, you know, philosophy about the nature of things and such. Uh, but the, the last data point I want to go over is uh, free choice. Uh, that's a big win for us, I'd say. Uh, and we do get, uh, we, we do get the free choice effects. Mary may have apples or bananas entails that Mary may have apples and that Mary may have bananas. And we get that through the LF and 32B. May RA uh, or RB. Um, and I just want to walk you through this derivation because it's a little different. Because if you remember for hopes, we said that the information state that hopes selects is the agent's belief worlds. But for free choice, we're going to say the information state that a deontic modal like may selects isn't just the world's consistent with information, it's the best world. And I wanna jump back then, um, if you indulge me, uh, to 24, which was on page four, and that's the, the semantic clause for, for deontic modals for May. And I just wanna walk you through what's happening here. So we're kind of, you know, we're basically doing like kind of a standard like Kratzery semantics for deontic modals that say, look, when I say it may be raining, the basic meaning is just there is a, there, one of the, it's, it's a standard deontic logic kind of semantics, and it says, look, may is a possibility, it's an existential, quant why can't I speak? It's an existential quantifier over a domain of the deontically ideal worlds. And what are those deontically ideal worlds? Well, the way we say it is, okay, basically context provides, you know, a domain of worlds that are just like the relevant ones. That's MW at a world. But then uh, the deontic ones, when I say what you're permitted to do, that's looking at just the best one. So the best of MW. So best MW is the deontically ideal worlds. Okay. And then, uh, but if you look at 24A on the right-hand side, 
The key is that, it, especially comparing, if you look, compare 23B with 24A, MW is kind of like BXW. That's like, just like worlds in a body of information. And we can, we can contrast MW with best MW. But the key is that with deontic models like May, their body of information that's relevant for them is the best ones, not just MW, but best MW. Whereas in 23B for hopes, the body of information that we cared about, you know, and that's in the right-hand side on that, on that superscript, the body of information that we care about is BXW rather than best BXW. So that's what's special about deontic modals. Although there's song and dance, we have, we have you know, there's things, other things to say, but for now, that's what we're saying. And, uh, and so now if we go back to free choice, the key is that may, when it gets redundancy operators in its scope, may is having the redundancy test be performed on the deontically best world. So when you have may non-redundantly have apples, that's gonna say that of the deontically best worlds, they have to be non-redundant. The deontically best worlds have to be non-redundant with respect to apples, which means there has to be at least one world where the, where the lady has an apple. And so when you have may RA or RB, first of all, we know from our weekly projection that a disjunction with each of the redundancy requirements is gonna, it, each one has to pass the test. So both apples and, ban and bananas have to be non-redundant. Then we know from the, from the meaning of may that the relevant body of information for redundancy is the deontically best worlds. And so we're gonna get, okay, the deontically best worlds, they have to have, uh, there has to be a world where they have apples and a world where they don't have apples. And there has to be a world with bananas and a world without bananas. And that gets you the free choice because if there has to be a world that's deontically best where there's apples, where Mary has apples, then that means Mary may have apples. So that's what we're saying is that free choice is a redundancy effect. Uh, and uh, that's, that's me, that's it. And then Kyle now is gonna really talk about some deep stuff here. Uh, and you know, I, I do just, yeah, no, that's good. Kyle, you're, you go. You sure? Yeah. Um, okay, I'll just end off uh, just briefly. I just wanna return to the issue of optionality. Uh, Simon kind of alluded to this earlier on, but I, I just wanna sharpen it a little bit. Um, so optionality for us was the observation that these ignorance effects tend to just disappear in certain environments. So if you look at 35A again, the detective doesn't believe that Anne or Bill did it. Uh, we argued earlier that um, the ignorance effect isn't scoping under just uh, negation there because if it did, it would, it would lead to a meaning that's weak and that's not attested. Uh, so this raises a question, well, why? Okay, why, why is the ignorance effect going away under negate, under uh, negation, for instance, but then in other times it seems to be present. And for us, that question can be made very sharp because we're trying to explain ignorance effects by appealing to this uh, operator R. So the question is, well, what what constrains the distribution of R? Why should R appear in some in, in some uh, circumstances or in some contexts, but not in others? And I'll say right now, uh, we don't really have a, a great account of it, but I'll just tell you, I'll just give you a kind of first run baseline account, which um, explains some things, but not everything. And this baseline account is called the strongest meaning hypothesis. So uh, people have discussed it quite a bit in the linguistics literature, it goes back to Dalrymple. People have also, uh, exhaustifiers have also appealed to strongest meaning to ex try to explain the distribution of exhaustification. Uh, I've got it down, on the, we've got it down the page, but don't worry too much about it, basically, it just says this, it just says, if you can, if you can put, uh, if you can optionally put operators into logical forms, uh, only do that if it doesn't lead to a logically weaker meaning. Okay, so basically, you think about LFs as competing with, with each other. So you have one LF without operators, another LF with operators. Well, which one do you use? Well, uh, if, if adding the operator leads to a logically weaker meaning, don't use it. That's basically what the strongest meaning hypothesis says. So there's a preference for stronger meanings. That's, that's the idea. Uh, and just with that very, very rough gloss, you should see already that that's going to explain why you can't put R in the scope of negation. Uh, so the two candidate uh, LFs for 35A are uh, 35B and 35C. And uh, we saw earlier that if you put R uh, under a belief report, that strengthens the meaning of the belief report, right? That adds more conditions. It's add, it adds more truth conditions to the belief report. So if you have a negation outside, that's going to, and you put an R under the scope, uh, in the scope of the belief report, that's going to weaken the meaning overall. So 35C is a weaker, logically weaker LF than 35B, and so strongest meaning says, no, don't use 35C, use 35B, and that's why R doesn't scope below negation. Now, 
There are wrinkles and the wrinkles have to do with 36 and 37 and also the observation that Simon made that um, an LF like 30C is ruled out. But I don't want to get into those wrinkles right now. One thing I'll say is that we are no worse than uh, the exhaustifiers because there's also no really good account, good predictive account of when the exhaust, where the exhaustification operator should occur. So uh, maybe we can talk about it more in, in Q&A, but I think we should end there and uh, be good. I would like to say, I'd like to say something though. All right. By way of conclusion. I would just like to talk about, you know, what our hopes are for this talk in terms of what to come away with you know, as you know, the main kind of helpful thoughts moving forward. And just a few thoughts. It's not the weak, cleany stuff. And that, you know, the, for us, the key thing I think that we would love it to come away with is having a real sense of embeddability, what Kyle's called a locality, as a just crucial test for if something is not merely pragmatic. And it's just for us, we just think it's so important, this test of embedding things under these special quantifiers, like exactly two, where basically there's no way to use pragmatic principles to derive the relevant effects. You have to have something semantic going on. But at the same time, also second, having coming away from this, this idea of these optional insertable secret operators that encode quasi pragmatic ideas, but are now not pragmatic as kind of this third path you know, beyond just a straightforward. And then the last thing I'd say in terms of a takeaway is, you know, I'm sure you guys all know, there's all these different semantic accounts of free choice on the market. And I do just, I do think that, you know, I think one real advantage of our account here is that we don't just explain free choice. We're explaining free choice along with a bunch of totally random other effects. And I do think that's a real predictive advantage. I mean, there are also significant costs of our account of free choice, but which I will not tell you. Um, but uh, I, I think it's a real advantage if you can explain free choice at the same time as explaining some other stuff, rather than just having this random account of, okay, we're just explaining free choice today, and it doesn't explain anything else, so we can't really test it any other way. You know, th those are, so I think that's one attractive feature of using this kind of optionally insertable semantification of a formerly known as pragmatic thingy, is that often these kinds of approaches explain lots of things in one fell swoop, rather than just being tailor-made for a single application. And that's all. Uh, okay, thank you guys.